Hello and welcome to The Hearing, our music review show here on the channel. I'm John. And from Chicago's north side, I am Scotto. And without any further ado, on to this week's album, which is from 1985, The Power Station by The Power Station. We inadvertently also set up an 80s week on both shows. <laughs> yeah. We have been living in the 80s uh, all week long. Mm -hmm. And it will continue next week. Um, yeah. And the Power Station are an English-American pop rock 1980s and 1990s supergroup, most notably made up of Robert Palmer, Tony Thompson, formerly of Chic, Duran Duran, and Duran Duran members Andy and John Taylor, um, no though relation. the Taylors are not related. <laughs> Everybody yet they look, point that out. Yet they look so much alike. And there are three it, of them if you, if you go you know, in all, all of Duran Duran. But None Andy and John Taylor yeah, there is quite a have to be distantly related in some way mm -hmm. because their faces are too damn similar. <laughs> the band when they were formed... younger, yeah, not so yeah. much now. Oh, yeah. the... Actually, I have no idea what Andy looks like these days. Um, the band was yeah, formed either. in New York City late in 84 during a break in Duran Duran's schedule that became a lengthy hiatus and cost them their drummer. Um and was named after the Power Station recording studio where the album was conceived and recording recorded. Uh, according to Wikipedia, the band's current lineup, and I actually messaged you specifically about this the other night, That's we, we mentioned that during Zombie Take It that I messaged you about something hearing related, because the current lineup consists of Tony Banks, formerly of Genesis, your favorite band. Yes. Um, Michael DeVar, who was their touring vocalist back in the day and really hasn't done anything else notable. Right. Uh, hmm. But, I mean, Tony Banks, uh, my favorite musician, pretty mm -hmm. much, yeah. you know, <laughs> who hasn't done rock music of any sort in 22 years. Well, the Power Station isn't rock, they're pop. Um, Andy, uh, Andy Taylor was the rock. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, Steve Ferrone on drums, uh, Peter Paladino on bass, both very well respected and in the 80s and early 90s, very busy session musicians. Um, if you've heard um, Come Back and Stay or Every Time You Go Away by Paul Young, that's Pino. Um, Wally He's Stocker. played on everything. Yeah, yeah. Wally Stocker on guitar. Um, Wally Stocker apparently played with the babies, and unlike Jonathan Cain and John Waite, didn't go on to something more successful. <laughs> And, of course, Andy Taylor on guitar, the only returning member. Um, apparently, he doesn't have a career now. Well, actually, of the originals, two were dead. Uh, Robert Palmer, T Tony Thompson, no longer with us. And John Taylor went back to Duran Duran and stayed. Yeah, from what I understand, Andy Taylor, like, after his uh, solo album didn't go, mm -hmm. he just went and... It became a producer full-time instead. He session guy for a while. He did go yeah. back to Duran Duran for a while. Um, I don't and then think it left a couple out. years ago. I thought it. I thought they tried. I, I thought it just didn't really. I think he. I don't know if he recorded with them again, but a couple, few, number of years ago, he was touring with them, like in the two thousands. Yeah. Um, you know, he did the full. Re they had the full reunion, and then he split again because he doesn't want to parent play pop, I guess. Um, and and this new lineup of Power Station will be releasing a new album next year called Reunion. Um, <laughs> I'll do back to this album that we're reviewing tonight. Um, the Power Station is the band's debut album. It was released on March 25th, 1985. The same year I started playing guitar, by the way. Wow. Which will factor into my review. Um, on Capitol Records, produced by Bernard Edwards, former, also formerly of Chic, and features Robert Palmer on lead vocals, Andy Taylor on guitar, co-lead vocals on Harvest for the World. I did not... 34 years I've known this album. I did not know that was him until I re did this research for this episode. Um, uh, like I said, I'm familiar with his solo album, so I know his voice very uh -huh. well. And, and he sang some stuff on Duran Duran, okay. uh, like a little here and there. You were much more into Duran Duran back in the day. Um, oh, yeah. I've become a fan in recent years. Um, John Taylor on bass and Tony Thompson on drums with additional musicians. Curtis King Jr., Fonzie Thornton. Love that name. <laughs> BJ Nelson and Charmaine uh, Birch on additional vocals. Lenny Pickett, Mark Pender, Stan Harrison, Hollywood Paul Literal, and Mars Williams on brass. And Roger Taylor, well, Roger Taylor, uh, Jimmy Brawlower, I'm just guessing on that pronunciation, on percussive <laughs> effects. And Wally Battero, uh, Steve LeBolt. Robert Sabino and Rupert Hine on keyboards. Surprisingly, Hine is not involved with production. He just played keys on it. Um, 
Reminder, of course, I don't edit any songs into our episodes for copyright reasons, but down in the description and on our blog at johnandscotto.com, A-N-D, you'll find links to the album on Spotify and YouTube so you can follow along if you'd like. On to track one, Some Like It Hot. This is the classic Power Station song. Yeah. This was the the one that, the first single, the one that really made them their name. Um, I still listen to most of this album regularly. Really? Because, I mean, I haven't heard this one in a while. Um, probably since I discovered Harvest for the World was actually a cover. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I always knew that. Um, I still love most of this album. We'll get to the one or two songs yeah. I don't love. Um, the opening drum part on this song is absolutely classic. Yeah, the weird thing about this album, it's like two EPs that could easily sort stand of, yeah, alone. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this album is truly a mark of its time where, in many ways, of course, but in the way mm. that you could have, that it's split with sides and yeah, the sides yeah. well, really everything mean in, something. Uh, up until the age of MP3s of, or CDs, up until the mid 90s, everything was put into sides. Um, opening drums are classic. I love the flanger on the drums. You never hear affected drums, particularly solo. Um <laughs> And there's a strummed bass part, which I think may have been Bernard Edwards. I know he did play a little bit of bass on the record. Um, and, and there are some parts that don't sound like John Taylor. Um, a lot of this review for me is going to be a love letter to John Taylor because he is one of my favorite <laughs> bassists. And I think one of the most criminally underrated bassists of all time. He, I, I mean, Andy Taylor really got me into Duran Duran mm-hmm. as a kid. But with, with those riffs. Interesting. But, getting older it, it's john taylor that that you know is mm-hmm. like oh yeah he's like the whole glue to the this Rio whole thing is a masterpiece the baseline of that song is epic um so yeah i'm going to be talking a lot about john taylor um but on this in this case i think that strummed part may have been bernard edwards i know he did play a couple of bass parts um love the horn stabs that just you know kind of they they really put a hook on the song there's a little horn stabs no, uh, the, the the tragic thing about this song is Robert Palmer needed to stick with this band because <laughs> this is what he was kind of chasing in his solo career and just never did it quite as good as it's done right here. Artistically, I'm with you, but he didn't tour with them because he wanted to release Riptide, well, which right. was huge. It would, I mean, that, and I get why he left because this was just kind of a, a almost just a goof originally, you yeah. know, kind of just. Well, we're, the original we're plan time. was for the the, the trio, um, t- the Taylors and Chester, or no, sorry, I'm, we're probably both going to say Chester Thompson instead of Tony Thompson <laughs> yeah. a lot. Yeah. Um, Chester Thompson was uh, is well, no, was Je- Tony Genesis Thompson. touring drummer. Yeah. He's still with us. Um, yeah. But you know, you're a big Genesis fan, and I, I'm very aware of Chester Thompson, so we're probably going to make that slip a lot. Um, but Tony Thompson um, and the Taylors were meant to play with a revolving group of singers on this album originally. Which would have been interesting as well, but I mean, I, I think they they should have stuck this out and, and probably followed it up even. Mm-hmm. Well, they did. It just wasn't good. Um, well, yeah. Ten, ten, 11 years later, though? Come on. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, speaking of Robert Palmer... Throughout the album, he does these great doubled vocals. Where he'll sing a harmony and then either, you know, he'll sing the main vocal and then a harmony up, above yeah. or down or even a unison. It, it, and they mixed be- they're mixed beautifully. Um, and I, I like how this one has this nice, simple funk part in the verses, guitar part in the verses. Taylor doesn't really give away how loud he's going to get until later. Right. You know, Wait a minute. Um, when you're saying Taylor... Andy, sorry. Andy Taylor. Doesn't give away how loud he's going to get until later. No relation. Um, you don't really expect it when that solo happens. Right. And yet, like I said, the riffs just really bring you in. It's kind of what draws you in originally. And it's interesting that you said that Andy Taylor brought you into Duran Duran because they don't really feature guitar. Well, it's that that riff from like "Hungry Like the Wolf." Oh yeah, okay that that's a guitar heavy song. 
Rio. I mean, those were the singles that yeah. that it was like, True. wow, this is. I mean, they are they're really doing so many different things at once. So, and I mean, come on, I was like, what uh, nine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and 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 you know, I, I was not a Duran Duran fan. It's not because I wasn't appreciative of, of Andy Taylor's playing. It was before I started playing. I actually was into pop and, and synth pop at the time, um, but. I'm a hipster from way back and they were just too popular and the girls all liked them and I was jealous. So I couldn't like them. Yeah. That was kind of complicated that the girls liked them too. Mm. So <laughs> that wasn't a good thing for that age. <laughs> right. And I was just super it, jealous. So, I mean, if I was a little older, it probably would have, oh, yeah. you know, been really nice, but mm. instead it was just awkward. <laughs> <laughs> Um, back to some like it hot. I love the whispered background vocals on the chorus. Oh yeah, Palmer's harmonies are even I think better, maybe better than his lead vocals on this record. The the production is just I mean, it, it's sometimes too good, you mm -hmm. know. But but yeah, the the product they really took it seriously. <laughs> That's and then we get to this ridiculous rock solo, and it's R A W K. Um, yeah, I had no idea Taylor could do that. Andy Taylor could do that. <laughs> I'm getting, yeah, because I, I typically refer to people when we're reviewing by their last name. It's going to be a stretch to throw in the first names. Um, you just have to keep saying no relation after. Mm. I had no idea Andy Taylor could do that back in the day. Because, I mean, I knew Duran Duran, of course. But here he's playing this epic solo that, you know, having just started playing 13 years old, I'm like bowing to. <laughs> <laughs> And I guess, again, another shout out to John Taylor, because his bass line is just so beautifully melodic on this and subtle. And like the uh, background vocals that at the on the cold ending, I love this. Look at that high background vocal. Wait, is this your pick for strongest? No, no, no. OK. Uh, we don't get to that until the end. Um, as All much right. as I love the song. I oh, love I most of this did, album. Uh, I, I thought we did that as we went along with the album. Well, no, my my strongest is one of the or the last two. I'm going to just tip it off. Oh, the last, the last two, two songs the are tied for my favorites. Um, really? Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love some like it hot. There's only two songs. There's only one song that I actually dislike, and we'll get to that. Um, on to track two, murderous. Here we get the full Andy Taylor. <laughs> they just go full on rock with this one. Yes, uh, you know, but. And I loved this back in the day, but I don't think this one ages well. <laughs> <laughs> I still like it. It's just kind of ridiculous and fun. It's got a good groove. Um, I'm picking this for my weakest, okay. actually. And and here's and it may ruin it for you when I state the reason okay. why. It is uh, has too much similar lyrically to um, Spinal Tap's Big Bottom. <laughs> I can hear it. That doesn't ruin it at all. Okay. It's, it's kind of, I mean, I, I like it because it's ridiculous in this instead case. Instead of, instead of that woman of yours is a killer, I kept hearing, <laughs> how could I leave this behind? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I definitely hear the similarity. And it kind of fits the song because it's this big, ridiculous rock it song. It is. It is just, it's so Spinal Tap. And this is after Spinal Tap, so they knew what they were doing. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> would have liked more bass on the verses, but I, though I do appreciate his uh, self-control. Um Love the bass sax on the chorus. There's actually a bass saxophone, which you never hear. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about now. Because that, that, that. The, the bass, even in the chorus, is kind of sparse. It's in there, but it's kind of shadowed by a bass, overshadowed by the saxophone. Um, great groove in the chorus. Another ridiculous rock solo. <laughs> I did like hearing a little more bass in the last verse. Um, You've got to hear his solo album. <laughs> I heard a little bit of it. It was a little too, like, wanting to be Steve Jones. Oh, it is just... Well, it's with Steve Jones. Well, yeah, he was a, a little too much of a fanboy, I think. Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> on to track three, Lonely Tonight. This is my pick for Weakest. Um, by the way, this was written by Bernard Edwards and Robert Palmer. Probably should have been a, a Palmer solo track. It probably should have. And uh, here's my notes. This shouldn't work. This should be hated. Okay. But as far as blue-eyed soul goes, they really do nail it, don't they? Except you talked about um, the last song having a similarity to another song. I noticed it with this one. It is What's... very similar to Ain't Nobody by Shaka Khan and Rufus. Oh, okay. Which yeah, was released two years earlier. 
and I think I is a much better that. song. I, you know, what? the only reason why this isn't my weakest or on my weakest mm-hmm. is I think I, I do like Palmer's vocal on this. Could it's, be one of his it, best vocals. It is but... nice to have him singing without you know a harmony or a double part. You'd hear a nice single vocal. That growl of his, though, why yeah, did yeah. he use that more? Mm. Um, synth bass was a little unnecessary when you have John Taylor. I mean, unless they recorded it as a solo track and just stuck it on there. It um, may happen. Yeah. The so the solo was totally plugged in, the guitar solo. Um, didn't really fit anything else on the song, because I think it is the only guitar on the track. Right, you don't expect it. It's kind of like, a, wait, what? And it's doubled with a synth, which was kind of interesting. Because it is a very Shaka Khan song. I'll have to listen to the, that original. Yeah, yeah. They're very, very similar in terms of groove. What and was even the name of the song again? Uh, ain't nobody. Ain't nobody. Ain't nobody love me better. You've heard it. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, I have heard of it. Yeah, everybody knows that song, and they're very similar songs. Um, on to track four, communication. This is the other one that I don't really listen to much, though I should listen to it more. Um, great groove, love the bass line. Um, I kept having to check if this was a cover because it's just so Motown. You mm-hmm. know, you could almost hear Michael McDonald singing this. <laughs> A little bit, yeah, I can definitely hear that. Um, I like how Andy Taylor kind of holds off until the second verse. Yeah. His, his, you know, stabs kind of come in as a surprise. It would have been like would have been nice to hear a little more as the song went on. Um, but John Taylor and Tony Thompson make this one. Right. I, you know, this was pretty high up there, honestly, for me. I almost went with this, but there was something else <laughs> that uh, that was just too strong to uh-huh. resist. Um, solo is kind of pointless and noisy. Um, it just doesn't, him doing the rock, you know, blow your cookies thing just doesn't fit this song. I think. <laughs> it seems like he just wanted to show off, which is a lot of this record, frankly. Well, yeah, pretty much. Well, cause you know, in Duran Duran, he was just so well, yeah, yeah. put on a shelf. I mean, you know? even at 13, I knew this was Andy Taylor with the leash off. Right. Uh, like just there's so much more he could have done on Rio instead of just the same riff over and over again for the whole song. But this was, you know, finally he had a chance to whip it out and stick it on the table. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that's exactly what he did. <laughs> so he did that on almost every track. Um, on to track five, get it on bang a gong. Another co- or the first of the covers actually. Yes. Um, this was originally done by T-Rex. This is a great cover. It is. Um, I know it better than the original. And I think I kind of prefer it. Um, I, I'm trying to, I knew, I did not know when I first heard it, that was a cover, of course, mm-hmm. in 85, but I think I, like a year or so later, heard the original. Mm-hmm. Um, hmm. I don't know. I do like them both a lot. They're but... both great. I mean, no, sh- no, no shade on, on Mark Bowen. The original is a classic. Yeah. But I think just the heavier guitar work r- works for the song. Right. I, I was looking up about the original and how he wanted to do um, he wanted to do Lil Queenie by uh, Chuck Berry. Mm. And that, that's where he got the yeah, idea. He, he the was basically part. trying to do his version of it because he couldn't cover it. Yeah. And uh, that, yeah, that was that was the song. Mm. The riff doesn't sound all that similar to it, though. I mean, I see where they 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 are related, but uh, mm. it sounds like every other Chuck Berry song. <laughs> He's such a love Chuck Berry. You think it's a little repetitive. Um, oh, yes. But I, I just think it, the riff, Mark Boland's riff, works better with more gain. Yeah. And in, in Andy Taylor's hands. Um, loved the kind of chaotic, heavily edited opening that just is makes no sense. Right. I mean, this, you, like I said, the album, this could have been the first side easily. Yeah. Uh, and that start with this. that um, drum fell kicks in, and the song really kicks in proper. It's almost a relief from this noise that is just you know brilliant. Yeah, love the staccato pace, picked bass part. Another one that's a little uncharacteristic for John Taylor. I think he may have played it though. Um, another solo vocal. Um, love how soft he goes amid the noise because he just kind of speaks this one almost. Yeah, he or croons it. With this insane um, guitar work, love the he love the dive bombs in the chorus. Andy Taylor just dive bombs all over the chorus. <laughs> um, and he just does what he does best. Uh, and both Taylors really do what they do best on this. Uh, John Taylor makes it groove. Andy Taylor makes it loud. And that is really the the 
um, Power Station in a nutshell. It's funk grooves, rock guitar. Yeah. And then Roger, uh, and then Palmer doing his kind of blue eyed soul thing. I'm not sure how Tony Banks is going to fit into that. It's going to be interesting if it is real. This was according to I Wikipedia. I also have not so... seen this verified anywhere. Yeah, this like, is according to Wikipedia. <laughs> no, no citation, and no, no Google other Google searches bear it out. So it's probably bullshit. But and think... after like less than a year after Tony Banks being interviewed saying, "Yeah, I can't really see myself joining right, a super right, right. group of any kind." Um, well, it's not really a super group and you know, you've got a couple of very well-known session players. They're not well known yeah. to the general public. Michael DeVar has faded. Um, the guitar player he was the guy from was, the baby. Honestly, DeVar. Well, yeah. Um, so it's not exactly a super group unless you're I... in just, unless you're a studio geek like me. Right. Um, but it is, I mean, in, in a way it kind of is because it's, you know, an assembled, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, in that sense, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not like an organic thing. Right. I mean, he kind of did something like that in the 90s with uh, Jack Hughes from Wang Chung. And I really want to hear that because I love Jack Hughes' voice. Where, where the two of them, I mean, it did songwriting, you know, mm-hmm. split the songwriting and everything. It was his only real collaboration because everything else, it was just him on his own outside yeah. of Genesis. If all you know from Wang Chung is everybody Wang Chung tonight, please check out the To Live and Die in LA soundtrack. Oh, of course. Yeah. Um, back to back get it on. Um, yeah. Love the bass solo. I mean, it's, oh. it's, it's just a bit of slap popping, but it's nice to hear John Taylor just really step out. Um, solo is just, again, kind of noisy. Doesn't really say much, but it actually works <laughs> on this track. Yeah, I mean, Andy Taylor's strong suit is not a, the solos. I mean, it's it's well, the riffs. It's the riffs, and and the, his solos, they act, they fit because they're just loud and noisy, and it's you know, he's windmilling, basically. Oh, definitely. <laughs> but it kind of works on the album. Um, I was actually dancing to this one while reviewing it. Oh, really? <laughs> um, that's how much I was enjoying it. I mean, it's one of my favorites. I'm not going to list other favorites, really, because I have a tie for my favorite. Yeah. Um, on to track uh, six, Go to Zero. I listen to this one a lot. It's one of two tracks that I listen to probably the most. Um, I mean, if I'm doing a soundtrack for like an 80s movie and you know, your score, and I want to convey that this is the 1980s that we're in i would use this song because i mean to be fair i have i am of that age where you know i I listen to stuff from my teens and early 20s mostly um as much as i my my favorites list is all newer artists you know within the last decade or so when it really comes down to it and i bring up spotify it's 80s and early 90s so you know this few tracks from this one get featured heavily um this is one of them again this is no the horns on this or a cliche at this point in time, but yeah. they became one. Yeah, yeah. I don't think they were because the horns on this album in general were kind of a surprise. Um, I don't think they'd become a, a big cliche by this point. Um, flashing back to last week, uh, the Fred Schneider album, um, I, I went on a little bit of a B-52s kick over the week. Um, first two albums are brilliant. Definitely check them out. Um, and I, I listened to Love Shack. Which I yeah. enjoyed the first thousand times, but it is so cliche, late 80s, trying to be super commercial R&B. Honestly, I didn't enjoy it back then. Mm. I, I liked it the first few times, mostly for Fred Schneider. Um, but the production is almost disgusting at this point because it is so of its time. And so, yeah. And I, and I realized the problem. I was looking at the production credits on the album. Don was. <laughs> He was that sound. Um, but and, and it's kind of, I mean, that horn sound in this, it's like the, the Crocodile Dundee soundtrack, which mm. came after this. I mean... It may it, have just be started to become a cliche at this point, but for me, it, the, the horns on this were kind of new. Um, but this one really is all about the rhythm section. It's, it's John Taylor and Tony Thompson again. Um, love the occasional distortion on the guitar. Um, the funk influence for John really shows through. Yeah. Um, again, really nice and melodic. The lyrics um, are kind of funny. I mean, when mm-hmm. it's cold, I'll wear a hat. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I think he was just fucking around. Oh yeah, yeah. Although, uh, with uh, a lot of the lyrics on this one, I think he Palmer was just fucking around. Yeah. Um, love the change in groove for the solo. It gets very electronic, and and 
again, it's just this kind of bullier cookie solo. Although he's oddly melodic in the first one. <laughs> like for John Taylor, for Andy Taylor, rather, it, it is a melodic solo. The first one. Having said that, the last solo is just chaos. <laughs> and he just makes noise. Yes. Yes. He, yeah. He just completely kind of, kind of Steve Hackett's it a little bit, actually. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the cliche image of of the kid running away from his parents while he's having the, the you know young young kid having his life paper changed and runs away in the middle of it and just streaks around the house. <laughs> that is Andy Taylor on this album. <laughs> At least when he when he kicks on the distortion, you know he he's got a little more control with the funk parts, but anything distorted, that's him. <laughs> on to track seven, Harvest of the World. This was tied for my favorite. Um, it's a cover of an Isley Brothers song. And yeah, I did not know this was a cover until years later, where I hear the Isley Brothers song, and I'm like, this this sounds so familiar. <laughs> it's not a super faithful cover. Power Station definitely put their own spin on it. I think they cut out some of the lyrics, too. It's... I, I, I've gone back and forth to listen to the original, and mm. I mean, they're both just great songs. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they're very different. Uh, yeah, to, and to like, to to listen to that song that's just so funky and upbeat and turn it into this is just, it's just insane. It's brilliant, really. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't, no, I love that it's a duet. I had no yes. idea who the other singer was until I saw it on Wikipedia looking this up. Um I almost for, for a while kind of doubted maybe Palmer was just singing it differently because there's nothing on the liner notes or anywhere else that I saw that said it, there was another vocalist. I think I, I didn't realize that until two years later when his so- mm. Andy uh, Taylor solo yeah. album came out. I'm like, oh, actually, no, wait a minute. He had a single, a hit single like a year after this. And then I realized, oh, wait a minute. That's okay, there. I vaguely remember that, but I, I don't think I really connected it. Um, he's got a surprisingly good voice for a guitar player. Yeah. And I just think this one works really well as a rock song. Yeah, th- this, I mean, this is my pick for the, the strongest track uh-huh. of the album, definitely. Because it just, I, I didn't want, I was trying not to actually, because I'm like, oh, picking a cover. Yeah, I had the same I'm debate. I'm going to pick the cover. I can't, you know. Yeah, I had the exact same debate, but I couldn't, I had to go with this one too. But yeah, this is just, the, this is crazy that this wasn't a hit. I mean, I guess yeah. they'd already had a cover out, mm-hmm. so they didn't want to put two out. But but seriously, and yeah. I mean, making a duet was a great choice too because Ron Isley is just a beast. Right. I, I mean, just handling all the ranges himself, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> like effortlessly, you're just like, oh wow, <laughs> that's uh, a <laughs> that's a uh, that's not human. <laughs> and I also love the subtle keyboard part during the verse. It's just a uh, you know an airy you know synth patch, but it just adds a nice little touch. The bass line is amazing probably more down to the Isley Brothers and John Taylor. Um, they probably borrowed a lot from it. Uh, I mean, you could see that the keyboards on this were probably some of the weakest parts to the mm-hmm. album. And well, it's, I mean, they, they were a bunch of session guys. Yeah. They weren't really a focus. Um, I do like the nice little subtle patch and the descending part that comes in during the bridge. And once for once, John Taylor doesn't blow his cookies. Um, <laughs> like he plays kind of a rock part on the chorus, you know, between the verse, after the chorus, before the verse, you could get this rock riff, which, and I love that treatment of that part. You're talking um, Andy Taylor, right? Sorry, Andy Taylor. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> no confused. relation. Yeah, yeah, I'd confuse them. Um, but love the, the rock treatment of that part. Um, but he doesn't play a solo, which is great. You know, he just lets the lyrics speak. And they are great lyrics. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they are. The, the, this... This was just brilliant to take this song. I yeah, mean, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it is embarrassing that I did not know this was a cover until mm. so many years later. I, mean, I think I original... found out some years later, but not many. Um, I think I probably heard the original on the radio at some point. Um, on to track eight, Still in Your Heart, another favorite, tied for my favorite as well. This one is just haunting. Love the, the opening bass part, just really inventive. Uh, I'm... I mean, I think I loved this as a kid, but it didn't really hold up now. I think, yeah, because the keyboards and stuff, 
<laughs> just yeah, really... it's, it's it's very of its time, but I kind of love that about it. It's, it's these yeah. you know, synth strings that just sound so dark and, and melodramatic with this great doubled vocal. And Andy Taylor's only contribution, and it's weird that it's one of my favorites, being a guitar player, um, is the, these muted strums in the first verse. That's all he does. Um, this is probably the most Duran Duran type song on yeah, the album, actually. Probably. Um, and I, I think I really also connect with the lyrics. Um, the, one of the verses is, try as you might the recollection stay, like a photographic memory of each day. You can feel her by your side in an empty room, and the words like forever you spoke too soon. I just, you know, connect with the kind of moody, melodramatic yeah, email Yeah, I did it. when I was a kid, man. I still do. <laughs> it was too much. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a nice synth uh, piano on the chorus, which has some great texture. And then, and these are words that I never thought I would say because I'm not a huge fan of the instrument. But the sax solo is kind of epic. I, I use the word "damn impressive," actually. Yeah, that <laughs> that that is why definitely why I couldn't say this was the weakest on the album because, but yeah, the sax solo. Uh, I mean, it's so '80s. Uh, you, you know, there's that thing about saxophones and, yeah. and songs. You you could tell what era right. the songs recorded just by how it is, and yeah, you expect the the dude with no shirt, you know, <laughs> playing it, but mm. I don't think it was him. No, no, this is an amazing sax solo, and it's got some nice off kilter strings behind the first part of it. They they could basically just like throw a flanger on this on that part, and it was just really complimented it really nicely. All right, so would you recommend it? Oh, definitely. Um, I wore this tape. I as a kid, I wore this tape out. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely recommend it. I've loved this album for more than thirty years. I still listen to a lot of it. Um, all but one song really will probably be in heavy rotation for me. I still just can't stand that lonely tonight. Um, but yeah, I definitely <laughs> recommend it. Uh, I, I'm actually going to listen to a lot more Isley Brothers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've listened to the whole album. I I, I turned, uh, I went to Spotify to listen to just to Harvest for the World, and then just wound up just listening to the rest of the album. <laughs> yeah, I have to listen to the original tonight. It's, it's been it a while. A few times, actually, since I, I've listened to it, not as much as I listened to this album in preparation for the show, but mm -hmm. pretty damn close, actually. <laughs> And that's it for Power Station. Until next time, we'll be reviewing So Red the Rose by Arcadia. This was a decision we had to make after we started recording. Um, I'll be editing that part out. But it's it's a, it's a the other side, Duran Duran side project. Um, the Taylors, well, John and Andy Taylor went to Power Station. Simon Levon, Nick Rhodes, and Roger Taylor formed Arcadia and kept with the pop thing. Although... From the one single, which is the only song I know from it, it's it's more interesting than what they were doing with Duran Duran. You should hope. <laughs> I hope so. I, I, I mean, I like Election Day. Um, and that's it. Well, until well, that's it for the Power Station. Until next time, we'll be reviewing. Um, I already said that part. All right. So until next time, and always remember, never forget wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. <laughs>